英語聞き流し10分間名作リスニング英語テキストと MP3 ダウンロードその他の物語はホームページよりご利用いただけます 88thpp.com 88thpp.com Tavo hastened to console her, for he at once knew that she was milk, and, as he was very fond of her, he gave her a good kiss. She was as fresh and pretty as a little dairy maid, and a delicious scent of hay came from her white frock all covered with cream. Meanwhile, Muddle was watching the sugar loaf, which also seemed to be coming to life. Packed in its blue paper wrapper, on a shelf near the door, it was swaying from left to right and from right to left without any result. But at last a long thin arm was seen to come out, followed by a peaked head, which split the paper, and by another arm and two long legs that seemed never to end. Oh, you should have seen how funny Sugar looked, so funny, indeed, that the children could not help laughing in his face. And yet they would have liked to be civil to him, for they heard the fairy introducing him in these words. This, Tildal, is the soul of sugar. His pockets are crammed with sugar and each of his fingers is a sugar stick. How wonderful to have a friend all made of sugar, off whom you can bite a piece whenever you feel inclined. Bo, wow, wow. Good morning. Good morning, my little god. At last, at last we can talk. Bark and wag my tail as I might, you never understood. I love you. I love you. Who can this extraordinary person be? who jostles everybody and fills the house with his noisy gaiety. We know him at once. It is Tylo, the good dog who tries his hardest to understand mankind, the good-natured animal who goes with the children to the forest, the faithful guardian who protects the door, the staunch friend who is ever true and ever loyal. Here he comes walking on his hind paws, as on a pair of legs too short for him, and beating the air with the two others, making gestures like a clumsy little man. He has not changed, he still has his smooth, mustard-colored coat and his jolly bulldog head, with a black muzzle, but he is much bigger and then he talks. He talks as fast as he can, as though he wanted in one moment to avenge his whole race, which has been doomed to silence for centuries. He talks of everything, now that he is at last able to explain himself, and it is a pretty sight to see him kissing his little master and mistress and calling them his little gods. He sits up, he jumps about the room, knocking against the furniture, upsetting Mytil with his big soft paws, lolling his tongue, wagging his tail and puffing and panting as though he were out hunting. We at once see his simple, generous nature. Persuaded of his own importance, he fancies that he alone is indispensable in the new world of things. After making all the fuss he wanted of the children, he started going the round of the company, distributing the attentions which he thought that none could do without. His joy, now set free, found vent without restraint, and, because he was the most loving of creatures, he would also have been the happiest, if, in becoming human, he had not, unfortunately, retained his little doggy failings. He was jealous. He was terribly jealous, and his heart felt a pang when he saw Tylet, the cat, coming to life in her turn and being petted and kissed by the children, just as he had been. Oh, how he hated the cat! To bear the sight of her beside him, to see her always sharing in the affection of the family— that was the great sacrifice which fate demanded of him. He accepted it, however, without a word, because it pleased his little gods, and he went so far as to leave her alone. But he had had many a crime on his conscience because of her. Had he not, one evening, crept stealthily into Goody Berlingot's kitchen in order to throttle her old tomcat, who had never done him any harm? Had he not broken the back of the Persian cat at the hall opposite? Did he not sometimes go to town on purpose to hunt cats and put an end to them? all to wreak his spite? And now Tylet was going to talk, just like himself. Tylet would be his equal in the new world that was opening before him. Oh, there is no justice left on earth. Was his bitter thought. There is no justice left. In the meantime, a cat, who had begun by washing herself and polishing her claws, calmly put out her paw to the little girl. She really was a very pretty cat, and, if our friend Tylo's jealousy had not been such an ugly feeling, we might almost have overlooked it for once. How could you fail to be attracted by Tylet's eyes, which were like topaz set in emeralds? How could you resist the pleasure of stroking the wonderful black velvet back? How could you not love her grace, her gentleness and the dignity of her poses? Smiling gently and speaking in well-chosen language, she said to Mytil. Good morning, miss. How well you look this morning. 
and the children patted her like anything. Tylo kept watching the cat from the other end of the room. Now that she's standing on her hind legs like a man, he muttered, she looks just like the devil, with her pointed ears, her long tail, and her dress as black as ink. And he could not help growling between his teeth. She's also like the village chimney sweep, he went on, whom I loathe and detest and whom I shall never take for a real man, whatever my little gods may say. It's lucky, he added, with a sigh, that I know more about a good many things than they do. But suddenly, no longer able to master himself, he flew at the cat and shouted, with a loud laugh that was more like a roar. I'm going to frighten Tylet. Bo, wow, wow. But the cat, who was dignified even when still an animal, now thought herself called to the loftiest destinies. She considered that the time had come to raise a tall barrier between herself and the dog, who had never been more than an ill-bred person in her eyes, and, stepping back in disdain, she just said. Sir, I don't know you. Tylo gave a bound under the insult, whereupon the cat bristled up, twisting her whiskers under her little pink nose, for she was very proud of those two pale blotches which gave a special touch to her dark beauty, and then, arching her back and sticking up her tail, she hissed out, FFT. FFT. And stood stock still on the chest of drawers, like a dragon on the lid of a Chinese vase. Tylo and Mytel screamed with laughter, but the quarrel would certainly have had a bad ending if, at that moment, a great thing had not happened. At eleven o'clock in the evening, in the middle of that winter's night, a great light, the light of the noonday sun, glowing and dazzling, burst into the cottage. Hello, there's daylight, said the little boy, who no longer knew what to make of things. What will daddy say? But, before the fairy had time to set him right, Tavl understood, and, full of wonderment, he knelt before the latest vision that bewitched his eyes. At the window, in the center of a great halo of sunshine, there rose slowly, like a tall golden sheaf, a maiden of surpassing loveliness. Gleaming veils covered her figure without hiding its beauty, her bare arms, stretched in the attitude of giving, seemed transparent, and her great clear eyes wrapped all upon whom they fell in a fond embrace. It's the queen, said Tiltal. It's a fairy princess, cried Mytel, kneeling beside her brother. No, my children, said the fairy. It is light. Smiling, light stepped towards the two little ones. She, the light of heaven, the strength and beauty of the earth, was proud of the humble mission entrusted to her, she, never before held captive, living in space and bestowing her bounty upon all alike, consented to be confined, for a brief spell, within a human shape, so as to lead the children out into the world and teach them to know that other light, the light of the mind, which we never see, but which helps us to see all things that are. It is light, exclaimed the things and the animals, and, as they all loved her, they began to dance around her with cries of pleasure. Tylthal and Mytel capered with joy. Never had they pictured so amusing and so pretty a party, and they shouted louder than all the rest. Then what was bound to happen came. Suddenly, three knocks were heard against the wall, loud enough to throw the house down. It was Daddy Till, who had been waked up by the din and who was now threatening to come and put a stop to it. Turn the diamond, cried the fairy to Tylthal. Our hero hastened to obey, but he had not the knack of it yet, besides, his hand shook at the thought that his father was coming. In fact, he was so awkward that he nearly broke the works. Not so quick, not so quick, said the fairy. Oh dear, you've turned it too briskly, they will not have time to resume their places and we shall have a lot of bother. There was a general stampede. The walls of the cottage lost their splendor. All ran hither and thither, to return to their proper shape, fire could not find his chimney, water ran about looking for her tap, sugar stood moaning in front of his torn wrapper, and bread, the biggest of the loaves, was unable to squeeze into his pan, in which the other loaves had jumped higgledy-piggledy, taking up all the room. As for the dog, he had grown too large for the hole in his kennel, and the cat also could not get into her basket. The hours alone, who were accustomed always to run faster than man wished, had slipped back into the clock without delay. Light stood motionless and unruffled, vainly setting an example of calmness to the others, who were all weeping and wailing around the fairy. What is going to happen? They asked. Is there any danger? Well, said the fairy, I am bound to tell you the truth, all those who accompany the two children will die at the end of the journey. They began to cry like anything, all except the dog, 
who was delighted at remaining human as long as possible and who had already taken his stand next to light, so as to be sure of going in front of his little master and mistress. At that moment, there came a knocking even more dreadful than before. There's daddy again, said Tildal. He's getting up, this time, I can hear him walking. You see, said the fairy, you have no choice now, it is too late, you must all start with us. But you, fire, don't come near anybody, you, dog, don't tease the cat, you, water, try not to run all over the place, and you, sugar, stop crying, unless you want to melt. Red shall carry the cage in which to put the blue bird, and you shall all come to my house, where I will dress the animals and the things properly. Let us go out this way. As she spoke, she pointed her wand at the window, which lengthened magically downwards, like a door. They all went out on tiptoe, after which the window resumed its usual shape. And so it came about that, on Christmas night, in the clear light of the moon, while the bells rang out lustily, proclaiming the birth of Jesus, Tavel and Mytel went in search of the blue bird that was to bring them happiness. Audiobook. Living in Kyoto by Hidemi Woods. Now on sale in online stores. 44 available distributors. Apple, Google Play, Amazon Audible, or else. ヒデミウッズがデザインした、とっても可愛いオリジナルグッズが手に入る。トートバッグ、缶バッジ、ステッカー、T シャツ、トレーナー、パーカー、文具、その他いろいろ。エリゼンドットコムで見てみてね。E